Hello, it's uh, <coughs> Thursday the uh, 28th, and I thought I'd take a few minutes to walk us through chapter one. This is the YouTube video for chapter one. Uh, next week we'll be in chapter two, and I'll do probably two. One on the content of chapter two, and one on some demonstrations. Today is kind of combined. If you've had a chance to look at chapter one, which I'm sure you have, since it's been on the syllabus, uh, you'll see that chapter one is uh, um, really a glossary. Uh, a lot of bolded terms that are very consequential to how we're going to uh, work through the semester. Terms like measures of association and sample and research and things like that. I want to walk through some of those terms. All of these terms we will be looking at again and again and again and again through the semester. So a good way to think about this chapter is as a glossary, but as a, a chapter that carries concepts that are very important for how we are going to uh, go through the semester. Concepts that we will use statistics uh, to apply. We'll apply these concepts. And remember, part of what we're trying to accomplish here in this semester is not just how to do the calculation statistics, but in a way more importantly to understand the concept of what statistics are all about. So let's uh, take a look at a couple of things here. I'm going to highlight chapter one and try not to get more than 20, 30 minutes in this video. All right. Here's the whiteboard. This is kind of the way we'll be doing things. Uh, probably the second uh, video every week, I'll be doing something on a whiteboard. The first one will just be me in front of the camera, likely. All right. So what, what you have here is something I want you to uh, take a note of and to remember. We'll talk about it again and again. You'll see this, this pathway um, several times over the next two or three weeks until it really gets embedded in your way, your statistical thinking. You know that we have four kinds of statistics in this chapter that we're going to elaborate over the course of semester. We have descriptive statistics, which I'm not sure I spelled that correctly, but descriptive, which is the subject of uh, the chapter next week. Rates, ratios, diagrams, uh, charts, pie charts, and things like that. How we describe uh, phenomena uh, will be that. And then we're going to have, uh, we'll move into, and this is, there's a logical sequence here that we will give this argument day in and day out through the semester. We move from descriptive to explanatory. Explanatory, like in descriptive, we'll look at age, for example. What's the average age? That's describing statistics. What, what is its average age? What's its distribution? What's the low average in class, or the low age in class? What's the high age in our class? What's the average in our class, average age? Those are descriptive statistics. As we move to explanatory, we get into two variables y equals x, the independent variable, which is often the research question, which we'll put a y here. Why does y vary? Uh, using income, for example, why does income vary? Not all of us have the same income. And so in an explanatory way, uh, we will look at what we think is a hypothesis. Maybe here we'll have income, and over here we'll have education, because we suspect probably why you're in college, right? As education goes up, so does income go up. That's a measure of association that the textbook talks about in chapter one. Measure of association. How strong is the association between education and income? We'll characterize that in our class as that, but also as an explanatory, because we'll be able, you'll see as we move into chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there, that we'll be able to explain with X, say in education, how much of the variation in income is due to education? Perhaps 20%. Then we'll say, what's happening to the other 80%? Well, that's the subject of another question, isn't it? Uh, some other hypotheses we might put out here, other Xs. But we'll find that education, let's say, can explain 20% of that variation. So when we put them in this kind of explanatory modeling, and you'll see these cross-tabulations, correlations, analyses of variance, we'll be able to explain how much of the variation in our outcome variable of interest, in this case income, is explained by our independent variable of interest, in this case education. And then we'll move into predictive in the latter part of the semester, and then we'll be able to predict, let's say, for each change in education, how much income can we predict? That's kind of a cool thing to know, isn't it? How to do that sort of thing. So there's a logical sequence in what they're talking about in this chapter, from descriptive to explanatory to predict or predictive, and that's the way we'll work it. Predictive is towards the end of the semester, towards the end of the text. Explanatory is around the middle of the semester, in the middle of the text. And descriptive is in the beginning of the semester, in the beginning of the text. 
So this is the logical progression we'll work on through the semester. And there's a whole lot of procedures, uh, statistical procedures that go underneath each one of these. All right. Now, looking at this pathway here, where we're going from population to sample to statistic uh, to parameter, this is inferential statistic. Inferential statistic is always recognizable in any text. Uh, you're reading a paragraph and it talks about samples. You know you're talking about an inferential statistic. Uh, so what we're after here, generally speaking, is a parameter. Maybe we want to know what the average age of, uh, in the city of Houston is. Well, the only way we could do that is go to everybody in the population in Houston, which must be three mil at least, right? And ask them what it is, get up three, get three million ages, add them all up and divide by three million, get the average. That's a descriptive statistic, by the way. But you see a dotted path on this arrow. That's prohibitively, inex uh, prohibitively expensive, both in time and material and personnel. You know, that's why the U.S. Census only does it once every 10 years. It's too expensive. But this is what we're after, the parameter in the population. So what we do is we draw down a sample of maybe a thousand, even though that's three million. You'll see in a three or four weeks the uh, mathematical logic of a sample and how valid it is for estimating a population parameter. But anyway, we pull down a sample. Uh, we do it randomly to make sure as best we can that the sample is representative of the population. You got 60% Hispanic here. If it's a random sample, you have roughly 60% in your sample. Let's say this is a thousand. So that we dialogue with the sample, with the survey. We ask them questions. What's your average age? And then a thousand people, we can ask that question, right? That's not too prohibitively expensive. So we ask them, and then the statistic, we take that all the ages of a thousand, divide them by a thousand, and we get an average age. That's a descriptive statistic. Because we've taken care to come down this way and get a sample size, and we'll talk about that in two or three weeks of sufficient size, then we do the statistic. We do the calculation of what we get as a result of our survey, and either descriptive, or we'll do an explanatory, or we'll do predictive. We'll do all three as a result of what we gain from that sample. And then we make the inference. We make the inference that had we gone from the population to the parameter, we would have found roughly the same thing that we found by going this sort of convoluted route. Now, the, the larger the sample size, the more precise the inference or more precise the estimate of that parameter. Now we'll talk about that in two or three weeks when we get to chapter six or seven. So, but you want to keep this in mind. We're, for our, the most part, what we're doing is inferential statistics this semester. We're trying to get a parameter, too expensive, so we go down through this sample to the statistic and then make the inference uh, about the parameter. If we had gone this way, we would have found roughly what we found by going this way. That's the logic of inferential statistics. And descriptive statistics, explanatory statistics, and predictive statistics are inside, embedded in all of that. Now, you can do statistics with, that are not inferential. For example, if we had, a, let's use a class, for example. Say there's uh, 20 of us in the class. We wanted to find the average age. It's not prohibitively expensive to ask each one of the 20 of us, what is our age? and then sum it all up and it divide by 20. We wouldn't have to do a sample of our class. It's right there in front of us. That would be a descriptive statistic, and there's no mention of sample. But if we decided, you know, 20 is too many, that we did, okay, everybody uh, count off one and two, one and two, one and two. And then we said, well, let's do, let's ask of the, the age of those who are twos. And so we sum up the ages of those who are two and divide by two, and by, uh, divide by however many that are. That, that is. That would be a sample. And then that would be an inferential statistic. And then we would say that by adding up the, the sum of the, of the ages of two and divided by all of that and getting the average age for the group of two, the two group, then we would make the inference that had we asked all the entire class, that would have been a pretty good approximation of what we would have found had we asked the entire population of the class. That's one way to think about the distinction. It's pretty obvious sometimes you have to read but it's pretty obvious in most places when they're writing about these things, they'll put sample in there. If they put sample in there, you're inferential. Uh, if there's no reason for a sample, it's basically a descriptive statistic. Okay, now I want to make a comment here about research and practice. There's no mention of practice in the text, but uh, a lot of us are practitioners. Some of us are uh, sociologists who want to get out professionally into the world and work for community-based organizations, a mental health department to do something in the way of community health. 
some of us are social workers and we're going to be doing all the good work that uh, social services workers do. And some of us are criminal justice. We're going to be out there working in the criminal justice system. A lot of us are then practitioners. Some of us will go to graduate school and do the kinds of things that graduate students do. But really, when you think about research and practice, um, there's hardly anybody in uh, the social sciences, maybe even in sciences generally, social sciences to do research just for research. There's always a reason why they're doing the research, and it really has to do with changing policy and some kind of practice. Uh, like, for example, a colleague of mine here at the university, Dr. Aran and I are working on a project with some students on persistence. Uh, what are the factors in the university environment that promotes per persistence, which is defined as students uh, graduating, uh, which is what we all want, right? Uh, sometimes you'll hear it as retention. University sees as retention because we hold on to the students. Uh, until their graduation. But from the standpoint of the student and the heart of the student, it's about getting to graduation and that's persisting. Uh, what Dr. Rana and I are doing is we're looking at uh, where persistence is the outcome variable and the university, oops, the university context is the predictor variable. So as we look across at the universities across the Southwest, we find some that are more successful at persistence than others. In other words, in some universities, more students are persisting than uh, other universities. So persistence varies across universities. What are the characteristics of universities that co-vary with that? And so what we're looking at is in this research, it's not just to understand that, which is important, but to help universities begin to think of best practices. What are the best practices you can do in a university environment, to pro in the university context, to promote student persistence? So even though we're doing research, we're really after the practice and the, the practical consequence and the value to students at university. So in the social sciences, that's generally the case. You go and do research on the west side of San Antonio to understand something about uh, social isolation of the elders in order to develop evidence for why you need to go to the county judge and ask for half a meal to develop some congregate meal projects to bring those isolated elders, elders into a congregate site every day for lunch. But you have to do the research. You can't just go and say, I want to do this. You've got to show the evidence, in this case, of the statistic to make that work. Okay, so research and practice. They don't talk about practice. Research is not just something you do just for the sake of it. You've got an angle in mind. You're trying to solve a problem. It's not about, it's not about why does this vary only. It's about what can we do to reduce the variation, you know? What can we do to reduce the variation persistence? It has a practical consequence on the right-hand side of the equation. So think of research and practice as two sides of the same coin. If you're a practitioner, what you're doing is largely, my guess is, will be founded on research that somebody else has done. You may find yourself out there in the, in the practitioner environment having to do research in order to justify a new program that you want to develop and implement. So think of them as two sides of the same coin and not something that's just isolated out there. Okay, now there's something else that I want to talk about, uh, two other things, if we can do this uh, talking fast, but hopefully, hopefully this will all work. This is our first go at this uh, using a whiteboard, and it's real easy to go on for an hour and a half, but who wants to listen to Blanchard for an hour and a half, you know, uh, no matter how good I might be. <laughs> so uh, the other thing we want to think about, and it's part of your, uh, part of your homework assignment, and that's the, uh, what they call the uh, wheel of research or whatever. I uh, want to think about uh, theory. It's, this, is, this illustration is in your text in chapter one. Here's the hypothesis. Coming around here are the observations. You have to listen to me because I don't write so well and if you try and read my writing you're going to be in hard, you're going to be in a pickle. The empirical findings and then up to theory. Uh, what they've got in the textbook, for example, is uh, contact hypothesis and prejudice. Y equals X, prejudice is the variation that we see in the world around us. The hypothesis is, is that, um, how do they call it, uh, the contact hy uh, hypothesis, they call it CH. Basically the idea is, is the more that we're in contact with people of other races, the more likely we are to reduce our prejudice. Or rather another way to think about it is prejudice may be a consequence of lack of contact with others. If we don't know anybody else, we don't encounter people of other races, we think they're really different, maybe even absurdly different. 
But once we get around them, we see, well, shoot, man, they're the same as we are. You know, maybe look a little different, just like we look a little different to them. But in the hearts and the souls and spirits and all of that, there's not a hill of beans difference between us. So this, this hypothesis then is that as uh, prejudice goes up, contact hypothesis. So as contact hypothesis, the more contact you have, uh, prejudice goes down. It's inversely related. As contacts go up, prejudice goes down. So here we have a hypothesis of, the, of that. And so we'd want to go out and see what if we could demonstrate that in this research circle. So they're also calling this a theory. But here we a theory is about a way, a, a series of statements that clearly explain reality. So reality of prejudice, uh, maybe it has to do with conflict theory. Uh, some people, some races, in some, some cultures and countries are predominant. They're in power and, and uh, are, others are, the other races are not in such an influential situation. Could be conflict theory in social sciences. Uh, but here we see that what they're calling a theory is actually a hypothesis. And so then we, we go some observation. We send an e let's say we'd send out a survey and we'd ask two questions. Uh, we'd, use, we'd take a psychology scale out of psychology uh, that's a prejudice scale, uh, one to ten. Ten being most prejudice, one least prejudice. And so we got a scale so we can see some people are up at ten, some are seven, some are down at one and all of that. And then we got contact hypothesis and so then we frame that as uh, shall we say frequency so that frequency of contact and so we say um, take this scale of prejudice and we get that response where are you on a prejudice scale of 1 to 10 and the respondents gives us that and this is a sample coming from what we talked about a few minutes ago and then we ask them uh, what's the frequency of, of your encountering uh, people races different than your own and so we take a look at the data and we apply the statistics here uh, to the observations we get from the survey. We look at rates and proportions of percentages. What percentage of people are in the high? What percentage are in the low? What percentage are in three contacts, five contacts, ten contacts? How do we do this frequency? And we may find that doing that, that the greater the frequency of contact, the lower the hypothesis. If the empirical findings, once we do the statistics, shows that, then we've uh, we validated the hypothesis and demonstrated the theory. So uh, the, this is a, uh, a nice frame for thinking about the process of research. These would be data. The observations would be data. And um, our analysis of the data through collecting with surveys, we'd apply statistics, like we were talking about a minute ago, descriptive and explanatory, determine the empirical findings. What we get as a result of that, support our hypothesis, and determine whether the theory is correct. Okay, and we'll talk more about this. It's just like introductory piece. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about this. It'll be in the conversation. It won't be anything I'll be putting on the whiteboard necessarily, but it'll be in the conversations we talk about issues in the um, in the um, kind of each chapter as we move through the semester. Now, one other thing, stand up here for a minute. So, pardon my back. Uh, last thing I want to talk about for now, so as we know a little more in 30 minutes, is level of measurement. Uh, we have nominal, and we have ordinal. Again, uh, listen to me because my words are not easy to read. Interval ratio. Now this level of measurement is very important to keep in mind. Uh, because a lot of the statistical procedures that we do later in the semester, which we use is determined by are they, all the variables are specified. Are they nominal? Are they ordinal? Are the interval ratio? In other words, some statistical procedures we'll be doing are specific to this one and this one and or to this one. These two here are generally considered categorical. And I'll refer to them that way. And these these here are continuous. And I'll tell you what I mean by that here in a minute. It's continuous. Listen to me, because if you read my words, you won't be able to read them. Right? I would have read them two days from now if I went and took a look at this video. Attention to what I say. I hope you can hear me. Over. Nominal variables are those that are um, different by nobody. Nobody. Nominal. Think about what it is. Uh, gender. Sex. Male and female. There's no scale that differentiates male from female. 
There are a lot of differences that are wonderful differences between males and females for sure. But in terms of categorical differences, uh, I'm a male and some of you are female, and that's it. Uh, Protestant, Catholic, uh, Jewish, Buddhist, African American, non Hispanic, white, Hispanic, white, all of those things are nominal variables. There's a scale of value, background. There's simply differences designated by uh, categories, uh, race, ethnic categories, and that's right. No way. These are often attitudinal. Or, but there's an order back there, added to like, for example, take happy. Um, well, it's clear what race and ethnicity you are, perhaps gender you are, perhaps, and all of that. These distinctions in these categories are clear. These are not quite so clear, but there's some order there that's than what you have here. Happy. I'm very happy. I'm happy. I'm not happy. You've, you know, you've had days when you're down, you know, you days when you're up, you know, you know how all that is. These are added two kinds of categorical distinction. You and I may be able to agree that I'm a male, but you and I may not be able to agree what constitutes very happy. We'd have to have a conversation with researchers about what constitutes. Before we put into a, say, an astronaut out there, you tell us you're very happy, happy, or not happy. We'd have to define that a bit. Say, oh yeah, I see what you mean by very happy. Okay, that I am. Uh, but there's an order here. Because I'm very happy up, so happy now. So these are often used as added no variance. Uh, here, interval and ratio. Interval are to change in, in a constant value. Like, I have children, I have one child, one is child, plus one is three child, one is four child. The intervals are constant. You might have intervals and the income is specified. Uh, income of 1,000, 2,000. Thousand. There may be constants that are, those are different by a thousand. Um, one thing that characterizes these two is, is a zero. You might not have any children. This could be income, you might have any money, or you might have 153 billion. Um, so, but yeah, these, these you have zero. You're never without an attitude, even apathetic with attitude. You've got attitude. Um, you're all here. Whatever you snip this is, whatever you enter is. You're a real is, you're an atheist, what are you thinking? Here, I Continues because they go from zero to a whole lot of whole kids, a lot of dollars, and, and that's it. I tell them, you're into sitting finally. in mind to you. You want to keep level of mind when it comes to procedure. Okay. Uh, well, I 